Um, it's quite a pleasure to um, have Marshall Burke from Stanford University with us today. Um, Marshall is basically an associate professor at the Department for Earth System Sciences and the deputy director at the Center for on Food Security and the Environment. Um, I think what makes his virtual visit exciting for us that uh, he works on the intersection between um, using alternative data to a lot of different applications in social sciences. Um, and that's quite in line with the things we do here as well. Uh, Marshall has done fantastic work, um, not only in the area of climate change, uh, the effect of temperature increases on agriculture, has done a lot of work recently on conflict. Uh, there's a recent paper out in Journal of Political Economy um, and uh, what he's also going to talk about today is basically using satellite data to infer uh, poverty and economic development at very fine granular level. Um, he publishes both uh, in the top nature and science journals as well as the top econ journals. Um, and he's also a co-founder of a spin-out, Atlas AI. Um, so it does a lot of things, it's very busy. Um, so we are very grateful that he took time to speak to us today. Um, and today's talk is uh, about using satellite data and machine learning to measure uh, um, livelihoods and predict poverty in Uganda. Marshall, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Paul. Thanks for having me. Uh, great to be here. Sorry, I can't be in person someday. Um, we'll escape the uh, the COVID disaster that is our country and and come to yours. Um, but but not today. Uh, so thanks for having me. Um, so uh, to to follow up on what Paul said, I'm trained as a social scientist and uh, economist in particular, and so I am very used to being interrupted in seminars. So please, at any point, um, either put a question in the chat, which will be hard for me to monitor, or better yet, just blurt it out. Um, more than happy to uh, take questions or interruptions. Um, let me share some pictures here. You guys see that all right? All right. Um, so yeah, so today I wanted to talk about, um, and I'm gonna roll, roll together a couple different papers uh, that we've worked on, some of which are out, some of which are brand new. Um, and they, uh, all of them have this common thread of trying to combine uh, what we can learn from satellites uh, in combination with machine learning based approaches to extracting information from satellite imagery um, and putting those two things together. Uh, what can we measure and understand uh, about the world in data sparse environments and settings in which we often don't have very much data to measure things and thus to understand them. Um, so we'll be mainly focused on the African continent today, uh, mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and we'll sort of drill down as we go, and I'll end with some new results we have that try to take these, these new data we get from satellites and actually use them in an impact evaluation uh, use case, and that will be uh, in Uganda. So thanks to a bunch of collaborators on this work from the machine learning and remote sensing side, uh, mainly at Stanford, but also at uh, the company that I co-founded Atlas AI, which I'll talk about a little bit uh, later on, because we're actually going to use some data uh, that was generated uh, at the company, um, which is nice. It's that founding the company has finally come full circle. We can actually do research with those data, which has been great. I'll talk about that. Uh, OK, so to motivate it, I don't think this crowd is one uh, that that uh, where this topic needs a lot of motivation, but just as quick motivation. So again, we're thinking about measuring livelihoods and measuring the impacts of interventions on livelihoods in places where we don't have a lot of off the shelf data. We typically, um, again, think of your standard uh, emerging market setting where there's not a lot of administrative data. The administrative data that exists is often not public. It's often not georeferenced. It's often sampled infrequently in space, infrequently in time. Um, and so it's hard as researchers or as practitioners to measure and understand things about the world that we'd like, right? So 
Often we go out and collect our own data. This is from one of our own survey data collection efforts. This is in Western Kenya, collecting data on agricultural productivity. Uh, and we use household surveys, right? And this is a tried and true measure of collecting certain types of data on productivity or data on livelihoods. Uh, and it's very good, right? Uh, we know how to do this. We know how to sample. We know how to run these surveys. We know how to analyze these surveys. Uh, the challenge is it's very hard, right? Each of these surveys can take multiple hours. Hiring a survey team can be quite expensive. And if we're lucky, we'll run an evaluation with a thousand people and talk to them maybe twice over the span of a few years, and then we'll be done. And we will have interviewed a thousand people in a corner of Kenya, right? Um, so that's great, but again, it's, it's very hard to scale. Um, and the difficulty in scaling those data can be seen, if I can advance my slides here, here we go. Um, if we just look at the amount of data available publicly. So on the left here, you see a map of the frequency of nationally representative economic surveys. So in particular, these are consumption expenditure surveys or uh, asset wealth survey. So here I'm including the, the DHS surveys as well. Uh, and the colors tell you how far you have to go, how many years you have to go in between surveys, right? So uh, a lot of the world, we get one every year or, or more than every year. Uh, but in key parts of the world that we care about from a livelihood perspective, data frequency is quite low. Uh, and often you have to wait five years, 10 years, multiple decades between nationally representative surveys. And even when you get one of these surveys, again, often they're not in the public domain, right? You can't even access the data if you wanted to. So this is, in some sense, an optimistic picture of the data availability in environments that we care about. Okay, these two scatter plots on the right show the correlation between the number of surveys you get in each country and uh, at the country scale, other things we know about these countries, right? So uh, average incomes or this polity score, a uh, score on the the uh, democraticness of the society. And sure enough, what do we find? In the poorest places, we have the least number of surveys. And in the most autocratic places, we have the least amount of data, right? So uh, critically important data, we lack them arguably in the settings in which we most want them from a livelihood perspective. And that matters because it inhibits our ability to do lots of things we care about the world, to make measurements, uh, to understand the impacts uh, of interventions. Okay, uh, so this is talk about satellites. Um, I'm not going to show you a bunch of satellite imagery, but here's a plot of how quickly the landscape um, of imagery has changed. Basically, the, the rate at which we collect Im imagery has, has changed pretty dramatically. Uh, so this is a time series plot, and the different lines tell you uh, the revisit interval of these different technologies. So at the bottom is the revisit interval average household revisit interval for an economic survey in Africa. So here we're not counting censuses, we're just thinking about, again, the nationally representative economic surveys that make the core economic measurements. If you're an average African household, you're gonna get seen, uh, a, if you're lucky, about once every 1,000 years. And the average is more like once every five to 10,000 years, right? It takes forever for an individual household to show up in a survey. Uh, in the US comparatively, and this is about the same in Europe as well, it's more like every 50 years, right? Uh, that's fine. Not every house has to be in uh, a given survey. We know how to sample houses and take averages, right? Uh, but just as an indication of how infrequently an individual household shows up, right? It takes decades or, or thousands of years. Okay, compare that to how often we see households in imagery now. Um, and particularly since the launch of a few private sensors in the last few years and the launch of some great uh, European satellites uh, by the European Space Agency, we now image the Earth uh, at roughly three meter resolution nearly every day, right? And so this is a capability that's really just been advanced in the last few years, again, but on both the public sector and private sector side, but represents just an amazing step change in, in what we can observe uh, about our Earth. Okay. So it's hard not to see these plots. And so the dark uh, solid lines up here, are the different uh, sensors that have been up, right? Um, so again, our ability has increased just dramatically in, in time. Uh, so the temporal resolution and also increased uh, spatially. So it's hard, uh, it's hard to see these and not be excited about uh, what this new technology and this new imagery might be able to do for, again, these measurements that we want to make uh, in the world. So can satellites help here? Um, consider the following 
schematic model, right? So uh, I have some outcome that I would like to measure. So first we're gonna talk about measurement, just can we measure the thing that we care about? Uh, and then the second part will be using those measurements for doing things in the world that we care about. Um, and this in, in particular doing uh, impact evaluation or program evaluation. Um, okay, so first prediction, can we just measure or predict the thing that we care about? So think of an outcome, a livelihood outcome, consumption expenditure or asset wealth. Today, we're gonna to be focused mainly on asset wealth because that's what we can measure uh, in household surveys. Um, as economists, we'll call these outcomes. If you're a computer scientist, you'll call it a label. Those are interchangeable. It took me about six months to figure out what they were talking about when they said labels, but they just meant outcomes. Um, so that's the thing we wanna predict. Um, we want to see if we can predict it with imagery. So imagery on the left here is our input. Uh, and, and between that then is a, a range of types of models we can use to try to interpret the imagery to summarize these incredibly high dimensional images uh, in a way that allows us to make uh, predictions. Um, and so I'll show you a few examples of this. So here's a recent one from a paper uh, we published last year. Um, so here we're going to use a couple different types of imagery. We're gonna use the classic nighttime lights imagery that I assume folks are fairly familiar with. This goes back now multiple decades in, in various forms and has been shown by a range of folks to be useful uh, in predicting economic outcomes and, and other types of outcomes. It has its issues. So here's an image from um, southwestern Nigeria, an oil producing part of Nigeria, densely populated. Um, and so I sort of cherry picked this to be a setting where nightlight uh, imagery actually struggles a lot. Uh, there's a lot of oil production and gas flaring down there. And so you get these blooms of nighttime lights imagery that turn out to be pretty uncorrelated with local household level outcomes, right? So this is sort of the worst case for nightlight imagery. It's actually very useful <laughs> in this prediction test more broadly, um, but I cherry picked it here. And that's because we, uh, we wanted to combine it with daytime imagery, uh, multi-spectral daytime imagery. Again, that goes back in time. Um, so this in this project, we're trying to not just make an accurate prediction today, but be able to do it back multiple decades, basically back to the early 2000s. Um, so we're going to use the other sensor or one of the other main sensors that's been up for multiple decades. And this is Landsat. This is a, a, an American set of satellites. Uh, and this is multispectral imagery. So uh, they these satellites capture reflectance in RGB, sort of what our eyes can see, but they capture other spectra as well, which can be useful uh, for measuring various types of human activity. Um, okay, so we have two different types of imagery. One is multispectral, one is this nighttime lights imagery. Those are our inputs. Our outputs are going to be survey-based measures, geo-referenced survey-based measures of, in this case, asset wealth. So this is measured in the demographic and health surveys. I assume folks are uh, potentially familiar with these surveys. These are a set of really nice nationally representative uh, harmonized surveys that occur in uh, most countries around the, in the world or most countries in, in the developing world every five years or so. Um, so again, they're harmonized. They ask a consistent set of questions. They're mainly focused on health. They have a little bit of economic information in, in terms of they ask questions about asset ownership. So we're going to take those questions. We're going to create an index that measures the asset ownership, uh, and we're going to try to predict that. Um, the georeferencing uh, is at the village level. And so we don't know where the individual households are. We only know where the villages are. And importantly, we only know imperfectly where the villages are to protect anonymity. The DHS adds up to five kilometers of random noise to the location. <laughs> So we don't know exactly where the village is. We know sort of where it is. Um, and that's the, so that's the information we have and that's what we're gonna try to predict. Um, so we get a lot of data from the DHS. We get uh, 20,000 villages roughly is what we have in this data set. Uh, and that's what we're gonna try to predict. Um, and the model we're gonna use here is, is, is a more or less standard deep learning convolutional neural network model here. We're gonna use a ResNet for folks who work with these models. Um, and I have a picture of a ResNet here. It is, you can think, uh, if you haven't seen talks about these models or haven't worked with them, I think one useful way to think of them is a layer cake, right? Um, where the point of the cake is again, to try to come up with a parsimonious uh, numeric summary 
of a very complex and high dimensional input image. Uh, and the way you're going to get that summary is you're going to stuff it through your cake and your cake has uh, basically, it starts out really fat at the bottom where it, uh, where it, where the image is input. And then what it's going to do is it's going to learn, basically figure out filters that it slides over the image and convolves or multiplies with the underlying input image, right? So convolutions here is matrix multiplication. If you like to think in matrices, it's basically what it's doing. Uh, and so you have layers in the convolutional, uh, in, in the neural network that do the convolutions. Uh, and then you have these other layers that apply transformations, typically some sort of nonlinear transformation, right? Uh, and so what this is able to do is then learn these very flexible but parsimonious representations of an input image and take a really high dimensional thing and turn it into a hopefully low dimensional set of features that are predictive of the thing that you care about, right? Um, so again, imagery input, we're going to train this thing to predict the output that we care about. In this is the case, asset wealth. Um, and because these models are very big and often have millions of parameters to train, we're really worried about overfitting, right? It's very, very easy to overfit these models, to learn basically garbage features, to fit to noise. Um, and so the way you want to evaluate these models is, is on held out data, right? You want to split your data set, you want to train on some part of your data set, and you want to evaluate your model on data that the model has not seen. And so that's what uh, we're going to do. Um, so Marshall, yeah. that's a question on these outcomes that you're looking at. So should I be thinking of this as mainly livestock in Africa or how much land individual people have, whether they own the land or are tenants on someone else's land? Like what is the main source of asset wealth? Yeah, great question. So a lot of it is, um, uh, consumer durables. So do you have a TV? Do you have a radio? Do you have a cell phone? Um, so there's there's that set of questions. There's things about your house. Um, how many rooms are in your house? What is your roof made of? Um, and then do you have, is your house electrified? What is your water and sanitation access? Uh, those are the main inputs. So we actually do not see anything about land, which is a problem potentially. Um, and we also do not see anything about livestock. So one thing these asset wealth, these asset indices definitely do a bad job is in pastoral societies where most of the wealth is tied up in livestock. That's going to be a subset of the places we care about, a pretty small subset, um, but that's definitely something to keep in mind. So we're probably under predicting wealth in, say, northern Kenya, where a lot of the, right, a lot of families' wealth is tied up in livestock. Yeah, it's a good question. So yeah, this is imperfect, right? What we would love to have would be potentially consumption expenditure, right? For each of these households or each of these villages, uh, those data are, are not available at scale. So it's, it's, it's the best we got. That help? Okay. Thanks for jumping in. Yeah, please, uh, please interrupt anytime. Okay, so let me just show you how well this works. Happy to, again, I am an economist by training, so I told you more than I know about convolutional neural networks, but um, to show you how well they work. If you have any questions, I can try to-, um, try to Actually, it. Marshall, just one more thing. So, yeah. so, so just, to, just to think about again, then how, what these biases might be. If you, if I, if I have then development that is more say associated with deforestation, will that sort of come off as like say more developed? I'm, I'm just wondering about like, if I'm thinking about development and also a sort of more environmentally sustainable development, will I then, if this land imagery is capturing things like deforestation and then in the data, it looks like deforestation is a great thing because it's typically associated with malls and all those wonderful sources of income. Um, will I then sort of bias against, well, like, will I tend to under predict primarily in areas that have done it in a more sustainable way? Or is that not a concern? Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's one of a general class of concerns about interpretability in these models, right? So arguably, if deforestation is predictive, like you say, if it's associated with improvements in well-being as measured by our outcome, then it's a useful feature in that prediction problem, right? Um, and so that would be, you know, to someone just interested in prediction, a feature, not a bug, right? Not a bias, uh, something useful. 
Now, uh, I think your worry though is is right in the sense that like then there's something built in there that we sort of don't like, right? Because we're saying deforested places actually look good from an asset wealth perspective. But just from a from the perspective of a prediction problem, like if that's useful in the prediction, then it's going to use it, um, and it certainly might be using it. So that would be my defense of sort of the bias okay. question. Now, <laughs> do you know what the model is doing? And so actually, I, I had some slides on interpretability that I can show you where the it's sort of the model interpretability is, is a very active area of research in, in computer science and figuring out what these models are doing is, is turns out to be hard. What you can do is basically it's learning these different filters and you can you can look at the images where the filters activate basically. So uh, what is it? it? It helps you have some sort of understanding of, of sort of what the uh, model is thinking is predictive of either a low wealth weight place or a high wealth place. And so for this model in particular, it clearly finds urban areas, it finds infrastructure like roads, things you can see in course imagery, it finds uh, waterways, it finds productive agriculture actually. Um, deep, but, but the model is not assigning any semantic meaning to these things, right? It's just, it's just so the model is just a pattern, right? So we're coming in and sort of cherry picking things that look like things that have semantic meaning to us, but really we're, you know, it's sort of a backhanded way of, of interpreting these models. Um, so I, I'm with you on both of those questions. Um, and actually uh, a version of your question is really important for the downstream task that I'm gonna show you about, uh, tell you about in a sec. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so here's how the model uh, does. So again, uh, we have trained the model on a subset of the data. And we are going to give it a pretty hard test, actually. So we have data from about 20, 25 different countries in Sub-Saharan Africa in this paper. Um, we are going to split the countries into train and test. So we're only going to train on a subset of the countries and test on held out countries where the model has not seen anything about that country, right? So this mimics a setting in which you want to make predictions or measurements in a place where you don't have any data at all. So think of Central African Republic or Somalia or some of these places that um, do, basically don't have any survey data available. We wanna know how well might we do if we predicted in those places, right? And the way we're gonna evaluate that is actually hold out Kenya where we do have a lot of data, predicting Kenya and see how well we do, right? Okay, so uh, on the left is the scatter plot. Each dot here is a village uh, or a, a this is not just a rural area, it's also urban areas as well. So think of a village in rural areas or a neighborhood in urban areas. Um, and on the x-axis here is our satellite-based prediction. So again, this is a normalized asset wealth prediction. Think of this thing as roughly having mean zero standard deviation one. Um, so on the x-axis is our predictions, on the y-axis uh, is the measured uh, asset wealth. And clearly there's a lot of scatter around that thing, but overall we're getting you know, the main, sort of direction, <laughs> correct. We explained about, so satellites, again, in countries where they were not trained, explained about 70% of the overall village level variation in asset wealth, right? So is this a perfect prediction? No, uh, but we explain a surprising proportion of the overall variation. Um, okay. Quick, quick question yeah. on that. Yeah, please. Isn't this is more kind of like an interpolation task because you're actually, the outcome variable is normalized across all countries. So usually in statistics, I would say this would be called interpolation because we are, yes, it's prediction exercise, but the outcome variable is actually average across all countries to normalize. So you actually have the information in all the other countries. So when you actually predict, it's kind of more like you're interpolating, I would say. Well, you don't have any information on the inputs, right? You, no, you're, output, you're, yeah. you're right that your output is, is constructed from shared information in the sense of how you map individual assets to a wealth index, but you don't observe anything about the specific locations, right? No, no, but the, the, the outcome measure is like an average, is a normalized PCA average across all countries. Sure, yeah, no, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so if your worry is that you're somehow bleeding data between train and test, is that your worry? Yeah, no, just to some degree. Yeah. I mean, it's not, I don't think it's a worry. I think it's just interpolation. That's what you need to do to get more data everywhere. So I don't think it's a worry. It's just because like the outcome measure is kind of like the mean 
is just construct the, the PCA component is just constructed having taken into account the variance of the country you're trying to predict, which is a very common thing you do if you do interpolation, like creaking or anything. That's that's very common. So it's not. Sure. No, you're you're right. Um, so the other way you can run this, um, so that the the way the data that DHS natively serves is uh, is an asset index that is generated just on an individual survey's data, right? So there'll be a Kenya 2015 survey, and it'll generate the asset index on the Kenya 2015 survey. So it turns out that that thing is highly correlated with the thing that we generate, which is to pool all the countries, generate oh, okay. the asset index, right, and predict it. So we've done the thing, and actually others have done the thing where you just predict, like you don't do what we did here and make it comparable across countries. You just predict on like the within country normalized thing. Um, and it works just as well. So I don't know if that assuages your worry perfectly. I, I think it what it tells us is the mapping of individual assets to the index is conserved across countries more or less, whether or not we pool countries and do the index or whether we do it country by country. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, how much time here? OK. Okay, so that's the village level on the left. Uh, on the right is if you aggregate up, right? Um, and so one thing you might be worried about, and I'll come back to this in a second, is uh, there are two sources of noise, potentially. One is the noise in our predictions. Our, our predictions are imperfect, uh, but there could also be noise in the ground measures, right? And there we know of at least one source of noise, and that's noise in, uh, in the geolocation, right? Of where exactly the point is. Uh, and the other is just sampling variability, right? So we don't see everyone in a village. We see a randomly selected 10 to 15 people in a village, right? So it's going to be a noisy measure of the true underlying latent wealth variable in that village, right? So if that's right, if there's noise in both your predicted and your observed, then it should be the case. And if that noise is random, if you aggregate up, right, some of that noise should go away. Your, your fit should get better. Um, and that's indeed what we see. Our squares go up pretty substantially, arguably. Um, they go up anyway. Uh, if you aggregate up to the district level, they go up even more if you aggregate up to the province level, admin one. Um, so that, on, on some level, is reassuring. Uh, these maps on the bottom show the country by country uh, average R squares. Uh, and while there is some variation, for some reason, we do a little worse on average in Kenya than we do, say, in Uganda. Um, we do great in Ethiopia on average um, for reasons we don't fully understand. Um, overall, we explain at least half and, and typically more than 60% of the variation uh, at the village level in held out countries. Should, in my mental model, should I be thinking of we're now using a prediction from a poor area of an otherwise wealthier country, like let's say Kenya. So it's like poor part of Kenya being used to predict what poverty is like is in a, in a country that is entirely poor everywhere. Is that sort of what's going on? Because those are the ones that then don't have the, the data to look at. Um, so uh, how we do it in practice is we sort of randomly split countries into train and test. One thing you might okay. be worried about is maybe in um, you happen to get a split where a bunch of your trained countries are poor on average and a bunch of your test countries are richer on average. And so you do bad in the, in your test countries that don't look like the ones in your training set. Um, and I think that could be right here. Kenya is a, maybe a little bit wealthier than it's nearby neighbors. And maybe that's why we do a little bit less well. Um, I, yeah, I think that could be right. So we you, also do poorly you, you in Malawi. Have data Malawi for everybody, right? So you have. So I guess I, what I was thinking about is I was thinking that you're covering areas that otherwise did not have any coverage whatsoever, but you're saying that we have at least some DHS data for everywhere in the in the in the um, in the African continent. Is that correct? Sorry, uh, no. The the countries where we have data are the countries uh, on this map that are not great. And so basically, okay. right now, we're not making any predictions in places that we can't validate. Oh, OK. Sorry so we're only, that. yeah, sorry if I didn't explain then that. My, my, then my question was moot. I guess I was, I was thinking about the question that I think you had mentioned earlier, which was, how do we try to look at countries for which we 
don't actually have that data. And I was just wondering then if the mental model should be that I'm thinking that a poor, that anyone in that area would be similar to a poor person living in a country that also has very wealthy areas because that's where you're more likely then to have the data collected. Um, yeah, no, I, I, think, I think it's an important concern. It's one that's hard to evaluate, right? So let's say you have, sure. let's say now we're interested in predicting in Somalia, right? So do we have any countries that look enough like Somalia that we think we're going to do a good job in Somalia, right? And we won't really know because we don't have any validation data in Somalia, right? So either we just make a prediction and hope we're doing well, or I mean, that's in the end often what we'll do, right? Um, but you think, okay, what looks the most like Somalia? Well, uh, parts of Kenya look like Somalia, parts of uh, South Eastern Ethiopia look a lot like Somalia, right? So you can see how well you do in those settings that look basically on, on observables as close as you can get to the target geography of interest, even if you don't have validation data. But you're, you're absolutely right. And so this is called domain shift, right? So if you start applying models in settings where uh, covariates are quite different, your models might perform poorly, right? Um, well, and so where I guess where I was going with that is I was then wondering, because there is some work that's been done on sort of income inequality and the difference of being poor in a country where everyone's poor versus poor in a country where some people are very wealthy. And the, so the sort of two directions in which that goes, um, that on one hand, you might have more access to infrastructure services. On the other hand, there's other things that are messed up. And so I was just wondering if within what you have, you can then start thinking a little bit about that income inequality aspect um, in terms of then thinking of then when you start predicting outside of that area entirely. Um, but I, I'm now slowing you down, so sorry about that. No, that's right. It's it's. Uh, I think your your specific example is part of a like a broader thing to be concerned about is when you're predicting into new environments. Like, is is the support of the thing that you care about that you're trying to predict or the covariates that generate that outcome, like is, is there shared support? And if there's not, I think you're gonna be pretty worried about the, the validity of your predictions, even if you can't. So again, we can predict in Somalia, we can't evaluate those predictions because we don't have any data in Somalia, but Somalia looks really different in terms of income inequality, in terms of whatever else is generating the outcome, right? We might be worried. So what all we can do here is say, look, within these countries, this thing seems to generalize pretty well, right? And so based on that, and that we see a lot of different sort of variation, at least in asset wealth across many different countries, we're going to say, okay, it's going to work okay in Niger or in uh, South Sudan or right some of these other countries where we don't have any data, and 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 we'll never know. <laughs> That's not true. Hopefully, we'll know soon. Um, okay, so uh, that was this recent paper. So it seems like the satellites and uh, and these deep learning models are doing pretty well overall. Not perfect, but pretty well. Um, we're not the only ones working on this. A lot of other folks have worked on this too. So this was from a recent review paper we had earlier this year, where we tried to go back and and sort of figure out had there been progress and sort of how are people doing on these tasks. It's hard because people are often measuring different things or measuring it in different ways, and so. Um, this was sort of a uh, crappy meta-analysis of, of what we could combine. Um, but people have been doing this basically for the last, I don't know, decade almost, many more studies in the last five years, progress. So each of these uh, dots is a study. Um, the outcome here is explained variation in some test set, and the dotted line is sort of a heroic fit to 12 points or whatever, <laughs> which is modestly sloping up, suggesting progress. Um, but basically in this, uh, in this overall review, like a lot of people are doing about as well as what I just showed you, you know, explaining two thirds, three quarters of the variation at the village level. Uh, and it often seems like combining satellites with other things, data from cell phones, from social media, I was talking to Paul about all their cool data on, um, on internet usage, right? Um, it has to be the case that some of those other data sets will also help. They'll be complementary to the information that you'll get from satellites. Uh, and that's indeed what studies have suggested. Often the combination of imagery with something else tends to do uh, a little bit better. Um, so that's a, that's a review. OK, so now, 25 minutes left, um, I want to think about whether these estimates are quote unquote good enough. Uh, 
And good enough really depends on the, the what you want to use them for. And so this is sort of a squishy term. That's why I have it in quotes. Um, and so really, the, you know, my interest in this is not, I, again, I'm not a deep learning expert. My interest is in using these data to do the kind of social science that we often want to do in the world, both to understand how trajectories are changing. So think of the sustainable development goals. Most of those, so we're supposed to, uh, th those come due in nine more years, right? Most of them remain very poorly measured in most of the world, right? So we can't even measure progress towards our key development targets, much less can we do the sort of impact evaluation at scale that, that we want to do for a lot of, a lot of interventions or projects, right? So I want to think about whether these estimates are good enough for those sort of downstream tasks. Okay. So in doing so, I think there's at least four relevant questions to answer. This is, again, at least, I think there's more than this. Interpretability is one. Um, we talked about, uh, but let me talk about four. So number one is diagnosis. So again, where are errors coming from? So the easy and I will argue naive thing to do is just to compare our predictions against ground truth and assume that any errors in prediction are from the machine learning model or from the predictions themselves and not from the ground truth. But most of our ground truth is not truth. It's an estimate of the truth itself with noise. And so you're comparing two noisy things and you need to adjudicate where the noise is coming from. You can't just assume it's all coming from the sky. So how do we think about that? Um, what I showed you so far was mainly spatial differences, right? We actually pooled a lot of years, but really we, and because um, we had VHS from a lot of years, uh, but, but really most of what I showed you there was just spatial variation. Uh, didn't really exploit the temporal component, which is much harder to test. So are we actually predicting changes over time correctly? How do we scale this stuff? Um, that turns out to be its own challenge. And then how do we use it in downstream tests? And I'm going to run out of time here. Um, I might skip a few of these. Um, let me see. Actually, yeah, I want your, the other stuff is new, so I'm gonna skip uh, some of this. Uh, let me start with scalability since it's um, key for the last bit. Uh, okay, so one thing that we found, at least in our own group, was um, it is hard to, so let's say you have a model that you sort of like, that you think is doing a pretty good job, and now you want to, uh, generate estimates at huge scale and at over and over time, and you want to be able to update those estimates as new imagery rolls in the door every day, right? Or every year, even. Let's say you just want to update it annually, right? That's a huge engineering challenge. Um, and Paul, I, I bet you you guys crew thinks about this all the time. We certainly do. Um, so just thinking about the imagery side of this, right? Um, one year of Landsat, even if you're not using all the bands, is like many terabytes um, for Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, if you want multiple years, right, just multiply by how many years you want. And that's just one of many inputs you might want to feed into this model, right? Um, now you're going to take these models and you're going to you're going to take these inputs and you're going to stuff them through a model. Um, and this is Key, if you, again, want to use this model to do something in the world, it turns out students don't tend to be too excited about that task, at least our students. Um, so this is sort of crank turning. This is not methods innovation. And so at least on our side, it's been pretty hard to get um, to figure out a way to sustainably take these sort of models and generate uh, estimates at scale in a way that we can keep doing over time. We can do it in sort of a one-off way, but it's just hard to, hard to do. Okay, so what we did at Stanford, and uh, Paul mentioned this at the beginning, is we actually, uh, with some startup money and then some uh, rich people money, uh, venture capital money, we have started a company that um, is trying to do this in scale, really now focused initially on Sub-Saharan Africa, where we have sort of global estimates that are not yet out, but that we're working on, uh, where we have devoted full-time engineers who can uh, do the, um, really do the engineering to, to generate this at scale, right? Um, and so this is sort of an old screenshot from our initial effort at this. It's sort of newer. And if you go on the Atlas website, there's actually a bunch of publicly available data, uh, sort of admin two level publicly available data. 
um, using basically the machine learning pipeline that I uh, just talked about. Um, so this has been sort of fun. I, I don't didn't know anything about uh, private sector stuff. Uh, luckily, uh, we were able to found this company, but not have to run it day to day. We have a great team doing it and some engineers that have been able to generate the data. So this is, at least is one way to scale this. I, I don't know if it's the only way to scale it, but it's certainly one way to scale it. Um, but what's been great is then in working with this company that um, now we can sort of work with these data. We can work with these scale data. So in the context of Sub-Saharan Africa, we have basically grid level, think of it as roughly five kilometer level data on asset wealth at the annual level going back to early 2000s, right? So you have basically two decades of very, very local, gridded, validated, where we can, asset wealth information for the entire continent of Sub-Saharan Africa, right? And so there's a lot of research applications that could potentially be used for. Um, and so we're just at the point where we can start to explore uh, some of those. So let me tell you about one of them in the last little bit. And again, this is newer, so would love any feedback. Um, okay, so I have a student, Nathan Ratledge, who has led this work. Um, and we just put an archive paper up um, five days ago. Again, so it's, I didn't put the link here, but um, love your feedback. Um, so he's interested in the impact of electrification on livelihoods, right? Um, and this is, in some sense, an easy one to motivate. So there's still, estimates are roughly a billion people around the world who lack access to modern electricity, which I think means, you know, consistent, um, consistent electricity to, to power a, you know, set of consumer durables, basically. Um, and the majority of these are in Sub-Saharan Africa, right? So 600 million is the estimate in Sub-Saharan Africa. Some people fully lack access. Some have only intermittent access to a generator or something. So think of this as sort of your, your, your grid level access. Um, and uh, because of that access problem, there's been a large amount and an increasing amount of, of money invested in expanding electricity access across Sub-Saharan Africa. So estimate we found was something like $20 billion invested. The proposals and some foundations that are trying to spend a lot of money on this um, are trying to ramp that up a lot. So many million billions going into this. Um, but there's still surprising disagreement on the impact that electrification itself has on livelihoods. Um, it's likely necessary. Is it sufficient? You could think of the, the argument is about, is about that potentially, but you can find nice papers on both sides of this debate in the academic literature. So the, this, the Taryn Dinkelman AER paper from 2011 in South Africa found uh, large positive impacts on livelihoods. This randomized control trial that Ken Lee and folks at Berkeley ran in Kenya uh, 2020, this just came out in the JPE, uh, basically found no impact at the household level uh, of grid access, right? So two very different findings. Um, so this seems unresolved. Um, and again, it seems important for the two reasons listed at the top. A lot of people are not connected, a lot of money being spent. So what can we learn? Um, Okay, so we're going to look in Uganda here, a setting where, again, many people did not have access, still don't have access, but have gained access over time as the grid has been expanded. And so that's what you see on the right here. This is the maps that Nathan digitized and somehow coerced from his Ugandan colleagues. Uh, this is maps of grid expansion across Uganda. Um, in 2010, a lot was built between 2011 and 2012. That's the period where we're going to focus. Uh, and then uh, in 2016, again, more was built. So we don't, we don't see it every single year. We see these sort of intermittent snapshots of, of where the grid was. And we're going to try to understand the impact of that grid rollout on livelihoods. Um, OK, so I just told you we can predict livelihoods uh, with satellites. So a naive thing might be to just take the off the shelf stuff that I just showed you, use that on the left hand side of some sort of panel regression and estimate the impact of electricity, gaining electricity access on, uh, on livelihoods. Okay, turns out there's a bunch of problems with that. Some obvious, some less obvious, some we weren't aware of when we started, but um, seem a little more general than we thought. Okay, so what are the challenges again in using off the shelf estimates? Number one, uh, and Leslie, this goes back, I think, to some of your questions, at least implicitly. Um, 
One thing that's really important here, so we're thinking about electrification, and maybe this is a bigger challenge in this specific setting, but I think it's more general. Um, our independent variable of interest might be baked in, might be somehow mechanically contained in our outcome variable of interest, right? So think of a model that uses both daytime and nighttime lights imagery to generate livelihood estimates, right? What are night lights also measuring? We know they're directly measuring electrification, right? So now I have an outcome measure that night lights is predicting. <laughs> and I'm now going to try to predict that outcome measure in a inference setup with electrification. And I should not be surprised if those two things are related because I have basically mechanically baked in my right hand side, my independent variable into my dependent variable, right? So that's a problem. Problem number one. Problem number two, subset of that is again, as I explained, the asset index, it actually incorporates typically information about electrification. So whether a house is electrified is an input to the asset wealth as it's as it's typically constructed, right? So again, you've sort of doubly baked in your right-hand side into your left-hand side, so that's bad. So uh, what we are going to do here, and you can tell me whether this is convincing, um, we are going to recompute the asset index everywhere, not using the electrification variable. We can also do it where we drop the consumer durables that are directly related to having electricity access. So like a TV, TV being the main one, so people, if they don't have electricity access, they're not going to have a TV. If they have a TV, they likely have electricity, right? So we can take that out of the asset index. We can take electrification or out of the asset index, right? And so we're going to recompute our outcome measure without baking in electrification into it directly. Um, and second, we're not going to use nighttime lights. We're only going to use daytime imagery, and in particular, coarse daytime imagery that we think is unlikely to directly pick up electrification, right? Now, you might be worried that it's going to pick up uh, some of the electrification related infrastructure. So maybe you can see grid uh, components directly. We have looked a lot at these images. Uh, I don't think that's the case in Landsat. Landsat is very coarse. It's often hard to see it in high res imagery. Um, it's been sort of a long standing project. Can you actually find this stuff in high resolution imagery? So it's hard to find it in low resolution imagery. Is it perfect? Would love your feedback, um, but that's going to be our solution to, to problem number one. Okay, problem number two. This is a more subtle one that we had not thought about. So uh, consider a simpler model, not a deep learning model, but consider a just the standard linear regression that you're going to use to predict. Uh, mechanically, in that linear regression, x beta, right, the multiplication of your, so your regression is you're regressing y on x, right? You estimate a beta, a slope coefficient on that, and now you're going to predict y with beta hat x. Okay, so the variance of beta hat x is going to be lower than the variance of y, mechanically, right? Because the regression has partitioned the variance into beta x, beta hat x, and epsilon, right? So mechanically, your prediction from a linear model, the variance of your predictions is going to be lower than the variance of your outcomes, right? Um, Easy to convince yourself this in three lines in R if you want to. Um, uh, it turns out practically, while this is not mechanically the case in a lot of these deep learning models, practically it is the case uh, in output from these deep learning models. Okay, so what does that look like? That just means the variance of your predictions is squished relative to the variance of your observations, right? And so here I flip the axes on the now predicted is on the Y here and observed is on the X. Um, but see, our predicted go from something like negative two to about two and a half, and our observed go from something more like negative three to three and a half or four or something, right? So again, we've squished the variance. What does that mean? That means that instead of sort of the one to one line passing through the middle, the slope of that thing is a little bit flat, right? Okay, so maybe obvious. Uh, is that a problem? It turns out it is. Uh, and we had to convince ourselves <laughs> both by writing out the math and by doing some simulations that this actually is a problem for downstream inference tests, right? Um, so I won't go through all this math. Um, I will just put it up. <laughs> so think of a standard difference in difference. Uh, I'll 
you guys care about the boring math that's in the paper, the math is not hard. This is me not even taking expectations, it's just literally writing out the simplest version of what a diff and diff estimate would be under your observed outcome versus your predicted outcome. Uh, and basically you can work out the bias in your true beta versus your diff and diff beta. And it's a function of how far you are off that one-to-one -one line. So basically it's a, it's a function of the slope coefficient in the regression of prediction that predicted on observed, okay? So that's what it is. And, and so basically then what you can show is that in a diff and diff, if you take this to a downstream use case, uh, your diff and diff is actually biased down and it's biased down as a function of how far your slope is away from one and a regression of predicted unobserved, right? So what this means is that the standard output from the CNN using your off the shelf loss function is going to give you biased inference in the downstream task, right? And so you have to, and so what we had to do, the solution to this that we came up with is actually come up, figure out a loss function that basically undoes this bias, that takes your slope back up to one. There is a penalty in doing this, right? Your model before was optimizing root mean squared error. It was optimizing predictions, right? It was getting the best root mean squared error, roughly the best R squared that you can get, right? So what we do is we end up actually losing some predictive performance, but uh, fixing this bias problem, right? So basically one of the findings here is that if you optimize on the standard criteria in the prediction task, you are going to mess up your inference task, at least in our setting. Okay, I'm happy to talk more about that. It's, it uh, was not something we thought about at the beginning. Um, Okay, so we're gonna take the model with this custom loss function. Basically the way we do that, I, I went through this, uh, sort of skip, skipped over this, but um, we come up with a loss function that penalizes uh, errors at different parts of the distribution, basically. So it's basically gonna take, basically what the model does is it over predicts wealth in the poorest places and under predicts it in the richest places. Uh, and if you have a loss function that penalizes uh, errors at all parts of the distribution equally, then you can sort of undo that. Um, and that's what we did. Custom loss function. We can generate predictions for all of Uganda with that custom loss function. Um, so now we think we're okay on the prediction side. Now we come to the inference side. Can we just run diff and diff here? What would you be worried about? Well, one thing you'd be worried about is who gets the grid, right? Um, grid placement is not random, it's likely endogenous to local economic activity, right? So we don't have an experiment here. Um, instruments are hard to defend. <laughs> we don't have a good one. Um, so we are going to try to use this sort of newer-ish class of estimators um, that really help deal with the thing we'd be worried about in diff and diff, which is a violation of pretrends, right? So what's the story we're worried about? We're worried that the places that are growing fastest are the places that get electrified, right? So absent treatment, they would have been growing faster anyway, right? Um, and so a standard diff and diff is then going to overestimate the treatment impact because it's just picking up the what would have been a fast growing area anyway, right? So again, you can convince yourself in simulation that some of these newer estimators actually do a pretty good job of correcting for that by closely matching on locations that were trending similarly to your treatment locations prior to treatment, right? So basically that's what we're gonna do. So synthetic control, I think is the more common one. Um, and we're using the synthetic control with elastic net, which is a slightly more flexible way to match each treatment observation to a set of control observations, so basically a weighted average of control observations, right? And we're going to do that separately for each treated observation. So it's generalized synthetic control. Um, and there's multiple papers on this. Uh, and then we're going to try this newer sort of black magic measures completion approach, uh, which Athe is popularized in economics. This actually goes back a ways in computer science. This was sort of the winning approach in this earlier. Netflix prediction task, if you guys remember where Netflix offered a million dollars to a team who could predict what movie I wanted to watch. Um, and Matrix Completion, I guess, was the winner in that. Um, 
So basically the idea there is it's sort of, it's sort of a nice idea. Um, what's our fundamental problem? Our fundamental problem is we do not observe the counterfactual, right? So we only see units, we only see treated units when they are treated. So the inference problem can be thought of as a missing data problem, right? So if we could predict the counterfactual observation from the treated observation, right? We could difference those two things and that would be the treatment effect, right? So think about then matrix completion as a way to predict the unobserved, non-treated observation for all the treated guys. So you are filling in the, the, the matrix that is missing key observations, key untreated observations for the treated guys post-treatment. And it does that by um, basically trying to estimate this parsimonious matrix, this low rank matrix um, using the, a combination of the pre-treatment data and the post-treatment data in, in the control group. Okay, um, so we're using those. Let me show you the results. Um, so again, we're focused on this period around uh, 2010 to 2012 when a lot of the treatment happened. Um, and basically these methods allow you to impute the counterfactuals for the treated guys. Uh, so we have our control villages in gray here, our treated villages in red. Not surprisingly, the treated villages were different in levels to start with, so they started out richer, okay? Uh, they were not, uh, they were not obviously trending differently, so if you look at the pre-treatment trends in the never treated guys versus the treated guys, uh, these trends were pretty similar. You can do a bunch of pre-trends tests and sort of modestly reject that they are exactly the same, but they're pretty close. Um, anyway, so then uh, in the post-treatment period, we can use these other estimators to generate the counterfactuals. And then basically our estimated treatment effect is going to be the difference between the, the estimated treated, um, sorry, the, the observed thing for the treated guys and then the estimated counterfactuals using these different estimates. So green here is a synthetic control and blue is uh, matrix completion. Um, and basically, uh, sort of no matter how we run this, we can run it. Uh, so again, we have two steps. We have this prediction step where we're using the CNN to generate the livelihood predictions. And now we have this inference step. We can do different things at the prediction step. We can have Uganda in our training data set, or we can not use Uganda at all in our training data set to simulate sort of the hard version of this problem. Um, we can just predict for places where we have validation data, the DHS, or we can predict everywhere in Uganda, those rasters I showed you before. Uh, and basically we get pretty similar estimates no matter how we do that. They're a little bit tighter uh, if we use the entire raster, not surprisingly, you have a lot more data. Uh, but overall they show about a 0.2 standard deviation increase in livelihoods uh, after a few years of electrification. So we can measure dynamic treatment effects here uh, and the treatment effects start small and sort of grow uh, over time is our best estimate. Um, so yeah, again, uh, to me, it's nice that these things all sort of line up. What's maybe nicest is you would have gotten the same answer had, had your prediction model not seen anything about Uganda. Had we just trained somewhere else, made predictions in Uganda on asset wealth, and then run this inference, we would have gotten the same answer, uh, which is nice. OK, let me wrap up one more minute. Um, so overall, I, I'm excited about the combination of satellites and ML for this sort of both measurement and downstream tasks. Um, in that review paper, I didn't really mention this, but it, it's actually quite hard to find real world applications of this combination of technology. So a lot of folks I think are thinking about using satellites or other sources of data, and I know you guys are too, um, in, in sort of measuring livelihoods and other outcomes. It's hard to find settings in which those have then been used for stuff we care about, right? Um, and that's because it turns out to be hard. Um, scaling, uh, various ways to do this, would be interested in how you guys are thinking about it. Um, we started a company to scale, uh, downsides and upsides. Uh, so this is some trade-offs there, uh, but so far I think we're happy. And Finally, we tried to provide one example of using this in a use case, and again, in Uganda electrification setting. Um, and if we didn't mess anything up, it suggests that electrification had positive effects on uh, growth in livelihoods, uh, 
about 0.2 standard deviations, which if you think about what was the sort of secular rate of growth, that's about doubling the growth rate over the period. Um, so treated guys grew about twice as fast as control guys after treatment, basically. So a, a pretty large uh, effect on livelihoods. Okay, so I'm right at 6 p.m. my time, so I will stop there. Um, but again, I can hang out with love any feedback or comments. Super. Thanks. Thank you very much, Marshall, for the exciting talk. Um, yeah, if you have a, a bit of time for questions, um, Sasha posted one question uh, in the thread early on. Sasha, do you want me to read it out or do you want to ask the question? Yeah, if you could read it out. Okay, uh, so you're predicting assets inside the household, uh, invisible from space as well. You mentioned mobile from phones, for instance. Yeah, mm. right. So, yeah, we're certainly not seeing mobile phones uh, at all. So, uh, what we're measuring is think of it as like a summary measure of households' uh, wealth. Right and really village level wealth. So again, we don't we don't see individual households. We see them in the survey data. We don't know where they are within a village. So we're going to aggregate up just average over all the households in a village. Right. So think of this as a summary measure of household asset wealth. It turns out that asset index is pretty immune to dropping individual assets. So we cannot do it on mobile phones. It's highly correlated. So in responses to Klaus's earlier question, right, you can do it within country normalized or do it pooled across countries, the thing is pretty stable. Um, so yeah, so think of it as not us seeing specific assets. Think of it as us seeing things in the environment that are correlated with the with, uh, households, villages having higher levels of asset wealth, right? And so places that have mobile phones, a lot of mobile phones and TVs and radios and electrification, tend to look different in imagery than places that don't have any of those things. So uh, yeah, yeah, I've seen some questions here. Um, so how well correlated was the course daytime imagery based prediction? Yeah, so how was, what was R squared on that? Yeah, um, so it was a little bit lower than when we use the nighttime lights imagery and it's a little bit lower than even more when we penalize ourselves, right, to try to fix this bias problem. So our R squareds were like uh, 0.63 instead of 0.7, right? So it still does a pretty good job, but it's a little, it's, it's slightly less good than using your sort of standard loss function and using nighttime lights. Oh, Leslie asks, uh, who are the clients funders of the company that created to scale the data? Yeah, so we got initial funding from um, Rockefeller Foundation. They sort of seeded the company and then we have venture capital money. Um, and yeah, the but clients the, we're working the, with are a range of public sector and private sector folks. But the VC money, so what is, so I guess my question is the market for this African data. So like who's, who, who's willing to pay to know how wealthy the Somalians are, for instance? Right. Um, it's mixed. So it's not just, uh, you, you know, the flip side of it is like, where are people with money who can buy your stuff, right? Um, so there's the private sector interest in terms of how do you target, you're, you're expanding a franchise, right? Where do you put it? Where do you go? Um, you're selling a thing, consumer goods, right? Um, where do you do that? So that's, that's one set of the market. Uh, another set is more on the impact side, right? So you want to target interventions, you want to measure their impact, um, how do you do that, right? Most interventions go unevaluated. This offers arguably a, a way to do it. It's a lot cheaper, that's more scalable, right? And so we work with, you know, uh, public sector folks interested in measurement or evaluation. And, and they're more keen to work with a private company than working with academics? Uh, yeah, these, I, this was new to me, but they, uh, it's very easy for them to work with companies and much harder for them to work with academics. Okay, cool, thank you. <laughs> Which was, was news to me. They would they way prefer, uh, it's just faster contracting for them to spend money on companies, which is weird. Okay. Uh, but it mirrors the experience here as well. Really, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Um, well, thanks everyone for,
coming to the webinar today. Thank you for the great discussion we had. Uh, Marshall, thank you again for um, taking the time to present. Uh, we really appreciate that. I already in, uh, invited Marshall if he has time and um, our government opens the borders in, we don't know, uh, but once you know we are back, uh, he's more than welcome to join in. Um, and I will let people know if he makes it so he can, you know, see a bit of uh, Australia. Um, just some advertisement, our next um, webinar on October 12th.